fast forward a few years later, um, I'm going on hikes for um, advocating for wilderness, expansion of wilderness here in the Gila. And there was a young woman there who completely had her shit together. Like she, I mean, she's just really young, his Latina woman who knew exactly where she was going in life and what she was gonna do. And she convinced me to take an interview with her boss. And, you know, three and a half years later, I am advocating for my community on a conservation level. I'm not just raising funds or being on advisory boards or panels, but I'm actually organizing my community um, to support things like the CDTC uh, and, and New Mexico Wild and the Wild and Scenic legislation that's been proposed in wilderness and things. Um, but again, it wasn't something that I had any interest in. It was just somebody decided that that's exactly the type of person we needed or that I was the type of person they needed for this job. Um, and it's been really, really fulfilling. I think when we think about trails, we need to we also need to think that trails aren't anything new. Um, and Teresa Martinez had, had mentioned that this weekend in a conference I hosted, but the trails are a way of connecting people and communities. Um, and this is a conversation that Teresa and I have had and a few other people have had. The CDTC in particular, the CDT, it connects an entire continent, right, of communities. like. I mean, an entire continent, and it doesn't just stop here. It doesn't just start at the Mexico border and then the Canadian border. The, the continental divide literally is the backbone of North America. Um, and it's, it's interesting because when you think about, you know, admitting that we're on, on indigenous lands and, and things like that, um, indigenous people had trails to communicate with each other and for commerce and, um, you know, to, to link their communities together. And, and so, so the concept of trails, um, I, there's a point to what I'm trying to say. Uh, you know, having something like the Connell Divide Trail is, is kind of like a westernized thing, like a very colonized concept, um, but it does have its benefits and uses. Um, whereas before trails were just, they were a part of everyday life. Um, and so, we've stepped away from that, that, that connection that we had to the natural world. And, and you know, now we drive cars and we have freeways, um, but trails still do connect communities. And I think one of the most important things with the work that I do is understanding the advocacy it is working for something long-term and sustainable. It's a long-term game, it's a long game. Um, I am not a person who has patience, right? Like, if we're up to me, I'd be like, okay, the CDTC is going to be completed tomorrow, um, and we're finally going to get the plaque, so to speak. Um, but advocacy means that we are working for something long-term and something sustainable, and so I'm glad that I've had that opportunity to be a part of this. Um, I think one of the more important things is, is that communities, and particularly along the trail, along the CDT, have this tool that they can utilize. Um, and what that looks like, I don't know. It, it probably, it's different for every community. I could not do my job in Helena, Montana. Um, I probably wouldn't have a desire to either. Um, but these are things that we can use economically. Um, we can use them to motivate people to, to to come to our community and spend money. I mean, really, you know, and, and being the place that the CDTC hosts its trail days and things like that, it we do see an impact from it, right? We do see a financial impact. People come and they enjoy the events they get put on. Um, obviously the last couple of years, it's been very difficult to do those things, but it has been a lot of fun. Um, and it has had an impact because in a way, it's kind of a marketing tool for our community. Like, hey, come to our community. And, and not only do you get to see this badass area, this beautiful place, um, but you get to, you know, hike a trail that connects an entire continent, um, you know? And, and I think there's what, four or five states, Luke? And it, it, it so it, it connects a lot of people. Um, and it's the major watershed of the continent. It, 
it decides which way water is going to flow. Um, so I, I, I don't have a whole lot to say about advocating or being an advocate. I just kind of look at it like I don't even consider myself an advocate. I just consider myself a community member. Um, this is my community. This is the place I'm going to die. Um, and I want to make sure that it stays sustainable in you know the next 100 years, 150 years. Um, climate change is real and rural communities like mine, particularly rural communities of color like mine, um, are, are going to feel the impacts in a lot of ways. Um, and we're already starting to feel those impacts. Um, and so maybe, I, I guess maybe in the quote unquote advocacy that I do, there's a little bit of me that, you know, wants to draw attention to places like the CDTC or the Gila Wilderness, um, you know, the Aldo, Leopold, things like that. I want to draw attention to them so that people understand that rural communities are just as important um, and that we, you know, we need a fighting chance when shit hits the fan. Um, and so if I can, quote unquote, advocate for my community with with things like the CDTC or, or the Gila Wilderness or the Aldo Leopold, why not? It, it'll draw attention to our community and hopefully it'll, it'll help save it in a way. Um, so anyways, that's, that's what I think about when I think about advocacy. And I know Luke really wanted me to go for like 10 or 15 minutes, um, but I don't think I did. Um, so I'm just going to hand it back to Luke. Um, and if you guys have any questions for me about the CDT in my area or the Gila or the Aldo, um, feel free to ask them in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Simon. That was perfect. Um, I really love your point about advocate. You don't consider yourself an advocate. You consider yourself a community member. Because I think that's a really salient point that a lot of our community members are doing advocacy. They just don't know it. And they're showing up for their community in these different ways and just don't call it advocacy. So I really love that insight. Thank you so much. Um, I will introduce our next speaker now. Um, Callie, if you wouldn't mind throwing up the slides again. Awesome. So our next speaker will be Jared Bynum. Jared is a Denver native with roots in Montana. Um, Jared joined Conservation Colorado in 2019. Um, his love for the Rocky Mountain West led him to become a protohete promoter and a legislative aide at the Colorado General Assembly. He now works as a community communities and justice advocate with Conservation Colorado, working to organize communities, and most recently was part of the leadership team that supported the passage of the Outdoor Equity Grant Program. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Jared. Thank you so much, Al. Um, and thanks to CDTC for providing me this opportunity to uh, chat with y'all um, in our gateway communities. So uh, as was mentioned, my name is Jared Bynum. Uh, I am from Denver, Colorado. Uh, I'm actually currently taking a hiatus in Nebraska. Um, Denver, as we know, are the ancestral and unceded lands of the Cheyenne and Arapaho. And then currently in the portion of Nebraska I'm in, uh, we are on the lands of the Sioux. Um, I have worked with Conservation Colorado for a little over two years now, uh, which has been phenomenal. Um, and I am currently serving in the position as the Communities and Justice Advocate. Um, this role, uh, you know, it, it is a titled advocate, right? I, I would self-identify as a, as a conservation advocate. Um, but what this job really means is that um, I spend the vast majority of my time uh, working directly with communities, um, environmental justice groups, uh, community leaders, BIPOC communities, um, and folks from, you know, all walks of life and all geographies within the state of Colorado um, who are experiencing disproportionate impacts, uh, you know, from climate change, uh, from water scarcity, from wildfires, uh, from the historic racism and redlining, uh, you know, that the environmental movement has oftentimes uh, served to perpetuate. Um, and really looking for solutions to ensure that, uh, you know, we can build a more inclusive future together. Um, could we do the next slide? Heck yeah, thank you. Um, so a little bit of background. Uh, I personally, I've always felt like I was going to be a, a conservation advocate. Um, it was just recently that I found out there was like paid jobs to do it. Um, but ever since I was a little kid, like I knew I wanted to, I wanted to either be like a wildlife biologist or a forest ranger or an urban planner, 
uh, for the sake of like building really dense cities so that we could protect all the nature or, or something, something of that sense. I always wanted to work outside uh, and I always wanted to work uh, in a space where I knew that we could protect our land um, and provide, you know, real meaningful access to people. Um, and this, uh, this poster is actually something that I created when I was like 15 in high school. Um, I went ahead and I founded an environmental club and that was sort of my start in doing this work really hands on. Um, so as I was a high schooler, uh, I noticed that like our school didn't recycle, which was weird because there's like 2000 kids um, in the total school. And we had a recycling dumpster um, and there's just no recycling bins. So I pestered all of the teachers and I asked why we weren't doing that. I uh, went to the principal and I asked why we weren't doing that. And ultimately I had to go to the superintendent. And I was like, why is it that we are not recycling at our school, right? There's 2000 kids. We write on you know, multiple pieces of paper every day. There's like tons of clerical work that happens. Um, and if we could just recycle, we could, you know, reduce our carbon, uh, we could reduce our carbon footprint. And what they told me was that actually, you know, like the district pays for recycling for all of the schools. Um, we have janitorial staff uh, that process the recycling um, and get it into the bins. Um, the only thing was we had like a stack of like 150 recycling bins for each of the classrooms that were locked up in a shed out back. Um, and nobody wanted to put them out because they were like, it's too much work. Um, so I got a bunch of students together. I got a bunch of teachers together and we said we wanted to recycle. Um, so we got the principal to unlock the room and I walked around with my friends and we gave every teacher a recycling bin and we printed off little sheets of what was safe to recycle. And we had to schedule time to do like a five minute presentation to all of the classes. And uh, ultimately the school started recycling. And that was sort of like my first like direct action, uh, you know, doing that environmental work. And it was really cool because I realized that if you wanna see changes, especially structural changes, like you have to be an activist, you have to be an advocate. Um, and even though at the time I didn't necessarily see myself going into, you know, like environmental policy, I, I had known that, um, you know, something special was happening there. Um, just being able to get people together around something that I was so passionate about and something that I wanted to protect. Um, and it was fantastic. Uh, one of the biggest things though, is I think that, you know, like my goal for, you know, conservation and advocacy is really looking into opportunities to like build community around this. I, I think that we forget uh, that, you know, the environment is ours, right? Like we are a product of nature as people. Um, our connection with nature, uh, you know, is intrinsic to our connection to one another. Um, and, and when we're looking at these massive landscape scale projects like the Continental Divide Trail, um, that connects so many communities and it connects so many people with all of these opportunities to not only, uh, you know, like build rapport, uh, you know, like with our friends and neighbors, but to also experience the landscape um, in, in some of these ways that, you know, numerous people don't even get to. Um, Thank you, Andrea. Uh, could we go to the next slide? So I, I, I'm gonna bet that none of you can actually read the text on the slide and that is totally okay. Um, I, I wanted to add this like to the presentation to make a point. Um, so this, this like PDF, <laughs> this like image here, um, this was produced by the Office of Legislative and Legal Services for the state of Colorado. Um, and, and not that anyone cares, but what they do is essentially in our state capital here in Denver or there in Denver, um, we have like this basement level where there's no windows and there's just like a, an office room of a bunch of cubicles full of like lawyers and economists. Um, and they're the ones who like turn like legislators ideas and like, you know, advocates like, you know, ideas into like bills. Um, and they produce this document uh, in layman's terms to explain how a bill becomes a law. And there's like 20 some odd steps and it's this, like, this isn't accessible to anyone. Um, it's actually my job to understand this document and to get people engaged. Um, and it's near impossible because it is, it is so lengthy and it is so like deep. Um, but the reason that I wanted to show this to you guys is because I personally, I think advocacy is like crucial to how we achieve successes. And I think in particular, the most powerful form of advocacy is the grassroots advocacy. And what's cool about this, uh, this image is that each one of those steps that you see, uh, whether or not you can read them, ideally you can see like the little graphics or emojis, each one of those steps is a space for public participation. Um, every single time, you know, like a bill or a bill concept, um, you know, goes to a committee or goes to the floor for a vote or moves from one chamber to the next or goes to the governor's desk, there's an opportunity there for anyone who has any sort of interest or vested interest or, or idea around what this should look like uh, to show up and to speak their truth and to influence elected officials and decision makers to tell the governor to sign a bill or to table it. Um, and I think that's really powerful. 
uh, because so many people feel as though, you know, like the legislative process or like the policy development process is not inclusive. And that's on purpose, right? I mean, look at this document. It was designed that way. It was designed to be as convoluted as possible so that only a handful of people who spend, you know, 40 to 60 hours a week doing the work could even begin to scratch the surface as to what's happening. Um, and it doesn't need to be like that. When we build coalitions of people, when we get communities excited, when we as individuals show up to speak on behalf of the things that like really excite us or that we really care about or that really impact our communities, um, oftentimes we can be heard because there are so many opportunities here that like, for the most part, people don't even show up unless we ask them to. For the most part, folks aren't even aware of what kind of decision making or landscape analyses or like opportunities exist within their communities or around their communities or potentially happening like at the state capitol or in Washington DC that affects their communities. Um, and, and taking the opportunity to like work with, uh, you know, advocates or community organizers or wonderful organizations like CDTC uh, to get involved in those opportunities is really empowering. Um, and it also really has an impact uh, because like so many of these people who are in decision making spaces, again, like they don't hear from community members nearly enough. Um, I guess something else that I would say, because uh, I'm also supposed to take 10 to 15 minutes here and I'm talking a little bit fast. <laughs> But something else I would also say is that uh, one of the most crucial skills for advocacy and for showing up as, you know, like a grassroots individual to, to really affect change on the things that we care about really is showing up. Showing up is like 90% of the work. Um, and sometimes that's what can be most difficult for folks. Um, oftentimes in rulemaking hearings or, you know, like public comment sessions or in, uh, you know, committees uh, when they're taking public testimony, uh, these people are not necessarily looking for experts. They're not looking for PhDs who, you know, know all of the intricacies of, you know, ecology and, uh, you know, like landscape ecology or biology or, you know, policy. What they are looking for is folks who can speak uh, their truth, people who really do care and who are impacted by these issues, who are experts in lived experience, um, you know, who can speak truth to power and say that, you know, these policies are important because of, you know, my desires as a member of this community and the future that I hope to see for my family and for uh, my neighbors. Um, and, and I think that's really crucial. Um, and it's also just a great plug to like thank everyone again for participating uh, you know, in this summit um, and for taking the time to learn about current issues and learning about ways to uh, get involved. Um, can we go to the next slide? So, um, as an example, or at least in my eyes, because uh, I got to, uh, this is like my first opportunity to really lead on something like this, but as an example of really, really strong uh, community participation um, and, you know, building good coalitions and, and really, you know, being able to pass good policy into law, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Colorado Outdoor Equity Grant Program, um, which CDTC, Andrea Kurth, uh, in particular, like really, really helped lead on. Um, this bill took two years to develop, um, which is actually super short for anything in like conservation or, or you know, like landscape policy, um, which is crazy because it, it felt like forever. <laughs> um, and in the process of developing this bill, we got over 60 organizations from all across the state of Colorado involved in this work. And we're talking organizations that focus on environmental justice, uh, organizations that focus on racial justice and inclusion in the outdoors, organizations that focus on outdoor education for youth, organizations that provide opportunities for, you know, like college students and young adults to uh, engage in conservation work, organizations that increase the accessibility um, for uh, disabled folks and otherly abled folks in the outdoors, uh, organizations that advocate for LGBTQ community members and their engagement in the outdoors, and so many other types of organizations um, that represent so many different like sectors within the outdoor space. Um, to really craft like a super exciting policy. Um, and, and what's cool here is that, you know, this bill provides $3 million in funding um, for a entire like slate of organizations and like government agencies, um, in particular, uh, you know, like registered tribes within the state um, to access funding to provide opportunities that are more inclusive. Um, and we gave really broad parameters so that organizations that are potentially understaffed or who don't have uh, you know, like really strong grant writing capacity or who maybe are, you know, like really new to this space and don't necessarily know all the ins and outs um, are still able to like file really compelling 
uh, you know, like grant applications and receive that money. Um, and it also includes a paid staffer who's going to, you know, be doing community outreach to ensure that people know these opportunities and get to stand up and participate. Um, but what's phenomenal here is that we uh, were charged with designing a coalition around this. Um, there was a lot of stakeholding from Next 100 Colorado, um, which is a uh, EJ organization that builds coalitions around these kinds of ideas. Um, and once we had the idea, we really had to step back and say, like, who needs to be at this table? And so we, and in particular, Andrea, really, like saying we is like a disservice. It was like 90% Andrea, and she's phenomenal. Um, but took time to reach out to so many people across the state, um, had so many phone calls, sent so many emails to get as many folks as we possibly could, uh, educated on the idea, up to speed as to what we were hoping to do, um, and excited to participate. And, and so we got to build this giant table um, you know, of, again, like over 60 organizations who are showing up consistently, who are helping us craft policy with our legislator, um, who showed up to committee to speak their truth and to talk about why it's important, who wrote letters to elected officials, um, you know, who, who showed up to our bill signing, uh, who showed up to other events and got great photos. Um, and, and people who were engaged, um, maybe not every single step of the way, every single one of them, but throughout the coalition, uh, we had engagement every step of the way. And, and I think that's what built so much success. Um, because ultimately, even though it took two years of stakeholding, it took us like four months to pass the bill, which is like fairly quick, um, you know, as an alternative. Um, and, and once we were able to generate that kind of buy-in, once we were able to demonstrate uh, how big our coalition was and how many excited people were there, um, the process was super easy. Um, we got confirmation from the governor's office before the bill even came to his desk. Um, that he was excited and wanted to pass it. Um, and that's astounding. And, and I think that's demonstrative of what happens when people show up and when people care about issues. Um, can we go to the next slide? Awesome. So um, just real quick photo credit, uh, all of those kids skiing in the front, uh, we got this photo from the Greenway Foundation, um, which is also a super helpful member um, from the Outdoor Equity Coalition. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit about the future because this is the part where like community-based conservation, uh, where folks, you know, standing up for the issues that they care about, where connecting with advocacy organizations is so huge. Um, and I guess I'll kind of start with the story. So I was hanging out with my best friend like two weeks ago. Um, and he's really cool, like super smart guy, but he feels so hopeless about the future, which is like common with like all of us Gen Z um, and maybe millennials as well. I mean, like all of the data about not being able to afford houses is from your generation. But um, oftentimes it's like really hard for folks who are new to advocacy or who are just like younger in general and sort of like new to the whole you know, universe um, to get excited about a lot of these issues. There's like 330 million people in this country, uh, like half of them are voters. Um, so sometimes it feels like our voice isn't necessarily heard. Um, getting involved in issues can feel so difficult and esoteric because there's like so many steps, right? Like sometimes it feels like you really do need a PhD just to like sit down with a document and understand what you're reading. Um, sometimes there are so many barriers, right? When they are doing hearings on bills in the middle of the day on a Tuesday when all of us are at work, like that's not accessible to people. Uh, when they are asking for folks to spend seven hours of their time waiting in line, just so you can vote in two minutes or speak for two minutes at a public comment session, that doesn't feel accessible. And, uh, you know, I really, I really understood where he was coming from because it can feel like so, so heavy, the burden of trying to show up. Um, when we're reading all of these articles about, you know, the future of the water wars, um, about how wildfires are getting worse, how our air quality is declining, how they're finding microplastics in placenta, right? It can all feel so hopeless. Uh, but what I reminded him of is like, we get to design the future, right? Like it's our choices. We're all participating in this society. Um, and, and there are extraneous factors, like don't get me wrong. Uh, but for the most part, like we get to take charge of what we want the future to look like, of what we want the future to feel like, of where we want to go, um, you know, as a community, as families, as a country, as states, uh, you know, like whatever unit you want to break it down into. Um, and this is like, this is the slide that gets me really excited because when I think about the future of conservation, when I think about the future of the Continental Divide Trail and of the work that I get to do at Conservation Colorado and of the work that, you know, Conservation Colorado and CDTC get to do as members of Next 100, um, I, I get excited because there are so many opportunities to like build additional inclusivity into the outdoors. There are so many opportunities to hold our boards and commissions and elected bodies accountable 
for being uh, not just inclusive, but equitable, right? Of providing public comment sessions that are after work, of providing paid positions, um, you know, for folks who are traditionally expected to volunteer hours, if not days, if not weeks of their time towards overseeing some of these causes, uh, of ensuring that we are actually heard when we show up and when we testify and when we write letters and when we vote, making sure that our interests are represented. Um, and when I think about the future, I, I just like put together a smattering of like some lame pictures. Some of them I Googled and some of them I like pulled from folders. Um, but I see like clean energy, right? Like maybe we shouldn't be burning things that pollute our air just for energy when there's better ways to produce it. Um, I see us achieving 30 by 30, um, which I'm not sure if it's been discussed on the summit, um, but 30 by 30 is a plan that by 2030, we want to have, you know, 30% of our nation's landscape uh, protected. Um, so that we can, you know, reap the benefits of the ecological services that, you know, uh, undisturbed landscapes provide. Um, I see community-based agriculture. Um, I'm on a farm right now. I'm on an organic farm and I'm watching it for my friend because apparently that's something I'm qualified to do right now. Um, and for the next week, I get to be an amateur chicken farmer. Um, and I think way more people need that opportunity. Um, I also see an outdoor recreation space that is racially inclusive. Um, growing up as a person of color, uh, you know, I was fortunate living in Colorado, where it is basically like an extracurricular activity uh, to go skiing regularly. Um, and I was provided a handful of opportunities through my school. Uh, but it was also because I was able to afford the tickets, right? Um, if my family didn't have $125 at the time, like I wouldn't have been able to go. And that was a huge privilege. Um, and remembering that not everybody gets those opportunities is really fundamental. Um, so overall, like I think the future is bright. Um, and I think that, you know, there are a lot of, you know, potentially like dangerous things on the horizon. But I think that with the collective that we're building, with the opportunities that like we in the conservation space are really working to provide for people, um, that the future will not be gloomy, um, that there are a lot of opportunities for people to get involved and that there will be uh, so many different ways that we can really revolutionize what we're looking at. Um, and with that said, thank you. I'll kick it back to you, El. Thank you so much, Jared. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm feeling inspired and motivated. Um, I think Jared's quote, we get to take charge of our future, really um, encapsulates what this, this session is hoping to achieve. So thank you so much, Jared. I really appreciate it. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to our last panelist for their presentation. Um, Karen Good has lived in Montana nearly all her life and has called the Lincoln Valley home for nearly 14 years. She serves on the board of the Upper Blackfoot Valley Community Council, is the lead coordinator of Envision Lincoln, and has worked with community stakeholders from diverse backgrounds to develop the Lincoln Prosperity Proposal. Karen believes that collaboration, unique partnerships, and a little elbow grease can cultivate lasting change that helps shape a healthy, prosperous future for rural communities. She works to maintain her community's small town charm while exploring new opportunities to boost the local economy and connect Lincoln residents to the outdoors. Karen enjoys helping children learn to cross country ski and runs the outdoor club at the school for kids K through 12. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Karen. Thank you, Luke. Um, wow, that's not an intimidating act to follow at all. Wow, <laughs> I am definitely inspired. Um, yeah, thank you so much CDTC staff for inviting me to present today. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Um, I, uh, like Luke said, my name is Karen Good. I'm from Lincoln, Montana, which is a small rural community with a population of around 900 people. And even though we're small, people love to visit Lincoln, mostly for the outdoor recreation opportunities and the wildlife viewing that our surrounding public lands offer, and for the slower pace and small town charm that Lincoln has held on to um, over the years. I'm a pretty active community member. I sit on the board of our local community council. I'm the lead coordinator for a group of stakeholders working on community development projects known as Envision Lincoln. And I run the cross country ski program at the school, just to name a few of my side hustles. Um, but today I'm going to focus on the Lincoln Prosperity Proposal which is a public lands proposal that I've been working on with Lincoln stakeholders and the Wilderness Society since about 2015. Um, our group or collaborative consists of ranchers, hunters and anglers, firefighters, outfitters, loggers, conservationists, 
motorized and non-motorized user groups and business owners. Um, so we're a group of folks with very diverse interests who came to the table to discuss serious issues surrounding our public lands. And while we may not agree on how we like to recreate on our public lands, the one thing we could agree wholeheartedly on was that the status quo was not working. And that was sort of the starting point to developing a public lands proposal that addressed important issues such as the health of our forests, recreation opportunities, and protecting the special areas within the landscape for future generations. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, like a lot of rural Montana towns, Lincoln was once a thriving mining and logging community, but with the extraction industry drying up, we've come to lean pretty heavily on recreation dollars to survive. Our, I'm sorry, but creating certainty for Lincoln's economic future based on recreation dollars was tough because there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding access to our public lands due to um, travel planning changes every 10 years or so. Um, and what we were hearing overwhelmingly from the community was that between road closures, wildfires, and lack of good paying jobs, um, Lincoln's future was looking pretty grim. And during those early conversations, our business community was really suffering. There were nine downtown businesses that had closed permanently. Our, our school enrollment was lower than it had been in years. And a study done by Headwaters Economics revealed that while other rural towns were looking at massive economic growth due to tourism and recreation infrastructure, Lincoln was actually facing quite the opposite future. Um, so these are just a few of the conversations that brought um, a bunch of locals from Lincoln to the table to talk about, or to talk with some pretty unlikely partners like the Wilderness Society about developing a public lands proposal that would address these issues and more and eventually become legislation. And by implementing legislation, Lincoln would be able to create the certainty necessary to build its recreation and tourism industry while also creating new job opportunities. Um, and, and also um, focusing on um, conservation issues, um, some of those I mentioned above. Um, and that's how we started down this path. Oh, I'm sorry, you can go to the next slide, please. Today, um, the Lincoln Prosperity Proposal is a well-balanced approach um, to land management that addresses recreation opportunities by developing new mountain bike and ATV trails. It establishes nearly 70,000 acres that will be managed for restoration, and it expands the existing scapegoat wilderness by 16,000 acres. It would designate a new 40,000 acre standalone wilderness in Nevada Mountain, and it protects more than 60,000 acres by creating conservation management areas. And it's worth mentioning that over 65 miles of the Continental Divide Trail would be protected in both these CMAs and wilderness designations should the proposal become law. Next slide, please. As an advocate for this project, I've personally spent much of my time in the last six years talking to folks about this proposal, whether that's at someone's kitchen table over a cup of coffee or at a public meeting with you know, 50 plus people in the room. The goal is always the same, helping people understand the proposal and pointing out where and how it might affect them personally, and then listening to their input and outcome or concerns. And that's really been key to, to getting support for this proposal, which is important because ultimately our end goal is legislation, which means we need our delegation to step up, see the benefits of this proposal and the new tools it offers our land managers so that rural places like Montana can have a thriving economy um, because of the terrific opportunities afforded us. Um, 
it's easy for me to become very Lincoln focused and talk about the benefits of this proposal for Lincoln specifically, but really this proposal offers benefits to all Montanans who value things like clean water, clean air, and pristine wild places. Next slide, please. We're not saying folks have to love everything about this proposal. Um, we know that there are folks out there that 100% do not want more wilderness. And there are also people out there who 100% do not want more motorized recreation. But this plan was never about one group getting it all. Like I said earlier, this proposal was developed by folks with different perspectives, backgrounds, and interests. Um, and we have a pretty significant list of supporters, and I think that's largely due to the amount of public outreach we've done in surrounding communities, but also due to the transparency we agreed upon early on as a collaborative team. And that transparency can be found on our website, lincolnprosperity.com, and the many op-eds, newspaper articles, and TV news coverage on the proposal over the years. We want people to know about the work we're trying to accomplish and to ask questions and to learn as much as they can about the proposal. I even have my um, personal cell phone number on our website and in our brochures because I'd rather get a call from someone with a question on the proposal while I'm making dinner for my family than to have that question go unanswered and end in opposition simply because um, they're lacking the information or knowledge that they need to, to, to make that educated decision. Um, something that I would suggest to other communities that are involved in an advocacy project would be to have at least one local voice that acts as a direct contact to the public, and then to figure out who should be the point of contact locally to initiate some of those harder conversations. For example, if you have, um, if your collaborative team needs to have a conversation with a local snowmobile club, think strategically about um, who should initiate that conversation. Maybe it's not the guy from the Wilderness Society, but maybe it's somebody locally from another club, like an ATV club, that is supportive of the work that you're, you're doing. Um, the initial community outreach process is important too. One thing that helped us get the proposal off the ground was engaging individuals early on from different local organizations that might be opposed to the proposal if they weren't part of the planning process, um, such as snowmobile, ATV, and sportsman club members. These individuals were invited to join our collaborative team and worked through the development and details of the proposal. And this was helpful because those folks were then able to keep their board members in the loop. And it also provided us with the opportunity to work through any issues they could foresee their board members voicing that might keep their club or organization from supporting the proposal. Because the support Support from your local organizations and clubs is gonna be important when you start um, talking to your delegation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, actually, can you, no, that's right, I'm sorry. I thought we were a slide ahead, but we're not, we're good. So one of the more unexpected and welcome benefits of forming relationships with partners like the Wilderness Society and a host of other partners um, has been the conversations it's led to in, in our community concerning other important issues that don't necessarily have to do with our public lands, but are important to the health and future of our residents and, and business owners. Um, these conversations have led our community to think about issues like um, pedestrian safety um, in our downtown, which has a major Montana highway running through it, or improving the health of our residents by creating connective community trails that lead to popular destinations like parks and rivers and medical facilities. And to think about some of those low-hanging fruit that our community could tap into 
a perfect example of this would be um, becoming a CDT gateway community. Um, so I really cannot stress the importance of building trusted partnerships that will help your community work towards their goals by offering support and resources that, that your community may be lacking. I would, I would also encourage folks who are interested in advocacy projects in their community to be prepared to be patient and, and to have a passion and commitment to the project. Um, because oftentimes these projects take, take a lot more time than we could um, ever imagine. And momentum can kind of come and go. Um, so you need to individually, but also as a team, be committed um, for the long haul. I would also encourage folks who work on advocacy projects to um, be prepared to be a good listener. Um, as you're likely to be engaging with folks with different perspectives, and they will want to know that you're actually hearing them. Um, have you ever had a conversation with someone and felt like they heard maybe one or two things that you said? That's because they did. And the rest of the time, they were just planning their response. So don't be that person. Be willing to listen and to understand that you may not be able to bring everyone along and, and that's okay. Um, a, and a strategy to keeping the public engaged um, is to be sure to use any and all forms of communication you may have available to your community, such as a local newspaper. Um, be sure to ask that that paper write about your project and interview the folks who um, are, are uh, your advocacy leaders. Um, this will really help folks stay engaged and hopefully um, encourage them to voice any conflicts early on. There's nothing worse than hearing about um, conflicts in the 11th hour. Um, and I think that pretty well wraps up my presentation. Um, just one more thing that I would add Kind of going back to what Simon said is, um, you know, I I have no experience. I had no experience before um, becoming involved in this project, um, and I would just encourage folks to not let that stop you. You you can learn um, about legislation. You can learn how to engage your community um, if you have. Uh, a passion or an interest in, in this work, I would just encourage you to go for it. Just do it um, and, and you'll be surprised how far you come um, in a short period of time. I, I hope that people felt um, it was a, that my presentation was comprehensive, even though I really couldn't dive into the proposal details um, like I'm used to doing due to the time constraint. Um, but if not, you could always check us out online at lincolnprosperity.com. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, my phone number is available um, on our website. So don't hesitate to give me a call with questions. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Luke. Excellent. Thank you so much, Karen. That was uh, that was a really inspiring talk. I love the work that's happening up in Lincoln. I think it's a role model for community-led conservation that's happening everywhere. And um, yeah, I love your point of just just do it. I love that phrase. <laughs> just just get out there and um, you know act on the things you're interested in. Um, so now we will be moving into our question and answer for all our panelists. So if I could have all my panelists come back um, with their video, um, and if we have any questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat um, or feel free to private message me um, if you don't want to make it a public chat to everyone. Um, we'll take about 10 minutes for questions um, before we move into some breakout rooms to do a bit of a visioning session. Okay, so Andreas dropped our first question into the chat. Um, so this is a question for all panelists. Um, what's a good first step for someone who wants to get involved with advocacy or is passionate about a, a topic in their community and doesn't know where to start? Show up. Um, you know, I've seen it happen a lot where 
particularly in this community, um, something is is made available. And I know that I, I you know, and I and I understand what Jared is saying that there are some restrictions to it, and, and sometimes it's hard to. You know, it's it's not necessarily rigged to be beneficial to everybody, um, or for everybody to have access to that. But I think the the most important thing for anyone who wants to advocate for any kind of change or any kind of sustainability in their community is to show up. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to show up with a sign or the intent to, you know, um, influence some type of legislation or anything like that. It's just showing up as a human being for your fellow human beings, for other people, for other humans, um, and showing up in your best self. Because if you can't, um, you know, we talk about advocacy like it's 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 this thing that you know, like we're, like we're a question is like how do people become advocates or what are some good first steps? But it's literally just showing up. Um, even if you don't understand it, show up and learn about it. Um, don't be intimidated by it. Uh, so, so, I mean, I mean, really, that's the only thing I can say is show up. Even if it piques your interest and you have no clue what's going on, show up in any capacity that you can. Um, and, and I think that's really important. I've got one um, community member here who is pretty much homebound but she shows up for everything in any way that she can. And then the way that she does that is she does write letters. She does make phone calls. So, you know, or, or she's, you know, she sends messages to people like even to myself, like today I got one that says, Hey, thanks for all the great work you're doing. Um, and so she shows up in, in, in some way to advocate for something. Um, and, and maybe sometimes it's not even about advocating for a piece of legislation. Maybe it's just advocating for our fellow humans in our communities. Yeah, and I would just add to that. I think the key word in that question is um, passionate. And that's exactly what you need. And that's why you would want to show up, right? Because just because there's a, a bunch of people in the room, it doesn't mean they're all passionate about the subject matter. Um, and so a lot of times, people will disappear, right? Things don't move as quickly as they want them to. Um, momentum drops. And um, guess who's still going to be there? The people with passion. So that's why you would want to show up. Jared, would you like to add anything? Not but we're running out of time, so I'll keep it succinct. Uh, I think everything that was said is totally correct. Um, and, and I would just add on to like those major points. Um, definitely don't hesitate to reach out. Um, one of the things that is cool about sort of like the philanthropic, like, you know, nonprofit sector is that even if you as like an individual grassroots community member, like don't know exactly how to impact the issue that you're passionate about or don't even know where to start. Um, like I, like seven years ago, I found Conservation Colorado because I was literally like how to protect forests like Denver and then it was one of the organizations that came up and I sent an email and then like within the week I was like connected with a field organizer and we got coffee and we like talked about all of the things um and that was super helpful I spent uh, a long time as a field organizer I think I was a field organizer for like six years following that um in various different capacities and uh I would say a good half of the conversations I had with people were just like figuring out what it is that they want to give to the movement and a lot of those conversations were like moving people somewhere else, right? People would come to me like, I wanna work on food justice and sustainable agriculture. And I was like, that's amazing. I do too. Unfortunately, our organization doesn't do that. So here's like a list of five organizations in the area that are looking for volunteers that do do that work. Um, you'll find so many people who are passionate about a broad spectrum of things who want to get you engaged. We have so many organizations like within the sphere that just like, we need passionate people. Like there's so much work to do. If you care, and even if you can only show up like one or two times a year, like we want you and we will totally like give you the tools that you need uh, to turn out and, and to have an effective voice. Awesome, thank you so much, Jared. Yeah, I love I love what all our panelists have said, that, that intentional showing up and that passion to follow through with it, um, really key pieces here. Um, another question that we have is, how do you find co-conspirators and accomplices in this work? Uh, a lot of our community members feel like they're the only one showing up. Um, so how do you bring people along with you? 
I'll take a stab at that um, and let others jump in. I would say um, something that's really helpful is you meet people where they're at, right? So um, for example, if you're working on um, implementing trails in your community, maybe um, your, your retirement community isn't coming along for that, right? And so you figure out ways to get them to come along, like think about your messaging. Um, and a lot of times you can get people to come along um, by, by saying something like, um, you know, trails are great for young people, right? Well, maybe they have grandkids, you know, maybe they wouldn't necessarily use the trails, but they have grandkids that would use the trails. And so that's how you get them to think about that. Um, if you have some sort of project happening in your downtown and, and people don't want to see change, well, you, you just have to think about the messaging that is going to encourage them to, to be more open-minded, right? It's a lot of times it's about messaging. And so like in Lincoln, we are working on a downtown um, project and there are a lot of people that are like, hey, we, we don't wanna see our downtown change. We like it just the way it is. But when you put it this way, you know, downtown Lincoln is unsafe for our youth. Nobody can deny that. And nobody wants to see a young person hurt or killed on our highway, um, which happens to run right through our downtown. So who, who can poo-poo that, right? Um, and sometimes you can even get people to come along, right? They'll be like, oh, that's a really great point. I did see, you know, a little kid on a bicycle that was trying to cross the road and it was so dangerous. We need more crosswalks. Maybe they're not going to love the idea of more sidewalks, but maybe you could get them to come along for, for portions of that, um, that, that plan, right? So that's, that's something. I would add too, um, that yeah, meeting people where they're at is crucial, but, but that also sometimes looks like redefining what showing up means. Um, you know, meeting people where they're at can, can be a, you know, uh, like a, a figurative, like let's talk about issues, you know, through their perspective and let's really sit down as community advocates to listen and to find the intersections between the work that we are passionate about and some of the issues that are most crucial to our friends and neighbors. Uh, but meeting people where they're at can also look like showing up at like a environmental event at the library and talking to as many folks as you can and getting them signed up on your cause. Um, sometimes it looks like, you know, going to a book fair at a school or going to a community event, going to like a chili cook-off, uh, you know, going to a church program um, and chatting with people, you know, sort of about these issues and how it might intersect um, with some of the things that, you know, brought them to that place on that day. Um, and something else too is really redefining what that action of showing up can be. Um, sometimes it's not just, you know, showing up to a, you know, chamber to testify. Um, sometimes it's not uh, making phone calls. Sometimes for folks who, you know, are, um, you know, like, like at their homes and who are, uh, you know, like unable or feel unsafe leaving, it looks like sending emails and, you know, like providing them with like a, a draft script so that they have a good idea of like what key issues they might want to talk about. Sometimes it looks like, you know, throwing your own little community events and giving people really straightforward tasks. Like we're going to make phone calls to these three legislators today, or we're going to, you know, handwrite postcards to some people, or we are going to, you know, get signatures on this petition. Um, and the fact that there are so many opportunities or like different ways for people to show up can be really helpful uh, because not everyone wants to spend hours in a committee room. Um, not everyone feels comfortable, you know, like verbalizing their thoughts, um, you know, over the phone or in person. Uh, but there are different ways for people to, to really have those uh, chances to, to say what they need to say. I, I guess I'll, I'll, I guess I'll kind of chime in here. Um, I agree with Karen 100%. It's, it's meeting people where they're at and relating to them. Um, in advocacy, I've learned that I've had to, I've had to wear a lot of hats. Um, and that means that, you know, sometimes I've had to kind of sit there and listen, just be a listener to somebody complaining about an issue that they're having with wilderness or why they don't support it or something like that. Um, but then I've also had to wear the hat of encouraging my fellow Hispanics and Latinos to get involved and to be a part of, of, of things. Um, and, and when we talk about, when we talk about meeting people where they're at, I, I agree with Jared that it could be a book 
you know, it could be a, a bookstore or books, you know, something like that. But I also think that meeting people where they're at means that we are understanding where they are coming from, that we are looking at the other side and where they feel they can contribute, right? Or how they feel they can show up. Um, but it's also not trying to influence people. I think, I think meeting people where they're at is actually educating and empowering them. Um, and when I say that, to make, I say that in a sense for them to make an informed decision about their own community and what it is that they're advocating for. Um, because if you don't have all of the knowledge and if you're not willing to share all of the knowledge and sit down at someone's table um, and talk to them, I mean, obviously we've gone through a really rough two years or, you know, 18 months, but aside from that, I mean, that was the thing that really, really helped me um, is to just kind of understand that sometimes meeting people where they're at is just understanding where they're coming from um, and understanding their histories with conservation or environmental policy or things like that. Um, and, and so anyway, so I, so I agree with Karen 100% is just meeting people where they're at um, and, and understanding where they're coming from. And I think there's a chicken getting murdered in the background. <laughs> chicken just went off really crazy right now. Wow. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you all for those answers. I'm going to ask one more question to end us on a, a bit of a high note, and then uh, we'll go into our breakout rooms um, where uh, you can ask some individual questions to, uh, to our panelists here um, if you have more follow-up that you'd like to do. Um, but this last question, um, Jared, you've kind of already touched on it, but you know, if you think of something else, feel free to chime in. But um, what are you most excited about for the future for your community, for your work um, advocating? Um, is there something on the horizon that you're just want to highlight here or just want to um, say how excited you are about? We have to choose one thing. You know, it doesn't have to be one, but you know. <laughs> yeah, there's. There's so much to be excited about, to be honest, in my community right now. Um, I don't even know where to start, but like, there's just a lot, there's a lot of partnerships being developed. There's sort of this new um, feeling in town where I feel like Lincoln used to be um, kind of, closed-minded and I feel like there's just this new open-mindedness in our community um, and and people are just more willing to come together and talk and and plan for our future together um, and it's just it's such a good feeling <laughs> it really is but um, gosh if I had to pick one project that's happening in our town that I'm just really excited about. Um, of course, I'm excited about the legislative proposal, um, but it's a little bit slower moving than some of the other projects, right? Legislation is not an easy thing to accomplish, especially when it comes to um, public lands. So um, I'm going to pick um, we're getting ready to start a downtown um, master plan, which really doesn't sound very exciting, but it's a huge step for Lincoln. Um, we, got, we got funding um, through a couple of different programs um, to start working on a downtown master plan, which is something that I have been advocating for, for years because our, because our downtown is really unsafe. Um, and it's also not the most inviting downtown. It's, don't get me wrong, like we, we love it here. We don't, we don't wanna change it too much, but we do, when people come into our town, want it to feel really welcoming to pedestrians. Um, we want it to be safer for children. We want people to want to um, get out of their cars and walk around. Um, you know, we have all sorts of things that are, um, going to all sorts of outcomes that will come from um, doing a downtown master plan, like building connective trail systems um, 
and crosswalks. And I mean, there's just so much, it's, it's exciting. And the reason that I'm so excited about it, I think is because it's a, yet another opportunity for our community to come together and, and plan together and just have those conversations. And, and that's my favorite part about my work is, is bringing the community together. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, I'm excited for the downtown revitalization too. I, I love spending time up in Lincoln. Um, so Simon, if you want to go next. Um, yeah. Hey, Karen, I wish you were here in Silver City. We have an awesome Main Street project um, group here. Um, and they are doing all of the things that you are talking about, revitalizing the downtown area, making it much more safer for people. Um, our team here, it, it sounds like I mean, hearing that, I'm excited for you guys because once you get to that point, you're, I mean, it's, I love our downtown area. Um, but back to the question, if I had to say that I was excited about one thing in my community or what's going on in my community, um, if you've ever worked with me before, you know that I work on a lot of things in my community. Um, so I'm just going to say everything, um, everything and anything that helps my community thrive and helps the Hispanic and Latino population and the mining population here. Any, I'm excited for all of it. Um, and, and so I'm not going to pick just one thing. I guess maybe what I'm going to pick is uh, I'm excited about my community. I like that. That's great. Um, I'll get Jared, any <laughs> <laughs> Jared, anything you'd like to add? It is super hard to pick one, um, and I guess just jumping on like the, the downtown revitalization projects. Um, ours look a little bit different in Denver, but I'm also kind of excited because we're going to rebuild 16th Street Mall, uh, which is just an awful place to begin with. Um, but it's really hard to choose, right? Like we're looking at like national monuments, state parks, uh, you know, sustainable, affordable housing, like transit oriented development. Uh, there's so many things that get me excited, but I think if I had to pick one, the, the thing that for me currently in Colorado right now is like the coolest is that uh, just last session, we passed a bill to establish an environmental justice board as well as an environmental justice task force. And what's going to happen is that when we fine <coughs> heavy polluters in our state, um, in particular, heavy polluters who are in communities that we have, uh, you know, uh, statutorily, uh, you know, uh, like delineated as disproportionately impacted communities. So communities that are primarily people of color, that are primarily low income, um, that are you know, identified by the EPA as like environmental justice communities. The money that we find these heavy polluters will go towards environmental remediation projects in those communities that those communities themselves get to decide on, uh, which I think is like foundational for environmental justice. And um, we are still in the process of like staffing up these boards and of starting to, you know, assess those fines and fees. Um, but I think we're going to see a lot of, you know, community-based conservation and a lot of conservation advocates um, coming out of the next generation with projects like these. Um, and and that, that just like gets me stoked and gives me a lot of hope for the future of this movement. Awesome. Thank you so much um, to all our panelists. Uh, thank you, Karen, Simon, and Jared so much for sharing all your knowledge and being here with us today. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, I know I am feeling motivated already to get out and start showing up more for my community. Um, and hopefully uh, some of uh, the people tuning in heard about all the great things happening on the divide and are ready to show up for their communities too. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Andrea to move us into our breakout room. Yes, I want to echo what Elle said. Thank you, Karen and Simon and Jared for coming on and being a part of the Gateway Community Summit. I'm so humbled and honored to know each of you and just to be a small part of the work that you're doing. So thanks for sharing with us. Um, so we'll have about 10 to 12 minutes for breakout rooms and I have them all set and we'll have a CDTC staff